we'll get started. Okay, well, I think the numbers have slowed down. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us. My name is Patrick Sullivan, and I am the President and CEO of the Halifax Chamber of Commerce. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to today's Navigating COVID-19 webinar with our law experts from Boyne Clark. I'm looking forward to hearing from our guests today on how to approach common business concerns that we're hearing from our members, particularly during this time. Concerns like, what do you do if you can't pay your business's rent? Or how do you handle customers who are unable to pay their bills or wondering if they can get out of a contract obligation? If you have a question during the presentation, please type it into the Q&A box. You'll see there are two boxes there, Q&A uh, and chat. Um, it would be better if you put it in the Q&A uh, and then everyone can see it. Please address your message to panelists and all attendees. That way everyone can see your, uh, see your message uh, and then we can answer it for, uh, for everyone. There's also the option to address your message to all panelists, in which case only I and the presenter will be able to see that. So it's my pleasure now. I'm just looking to see if uh, Dee has been able to join us. I don't think so. Uh, so I think I'm going to skip over Dee. I'm sorry, Dee, but we'll come back to you. Don't worry. Oh, there you are. There you are. Look at that. That's timing. <laughs> oh, and there we go. Yeah, that, that took some doing. I had to enter a whole way. I didn't know what I was doing. So I mean, right. Okay, well, now it's my pleasure to introduce Dee DeVille, Chair of the Greater Burnside Business Association and one of the Halifax Chamber's ambassadors to say a few words. Dee, can I call Thank you? Thank you, Pat. I just wanted to welcome everyone to the webinar. I think it's very exciting to have uh, the Chamber host our webinar for the GBBA. We're a, a small organization, a, a nonprofit, uh, volunteer run organization, of course, advocating on behalf of Burnside businesses. And of course, our, our, our corporate sponsor is Boyne Clark. So we're thrilled to have Boyne Clark here to answer your questions. And uh, that's really all I wanted to say, just to, to let you know and welcome you to here. And thanks so much, Pat, for doing, uh, doing what you do so well. well. Thank you very much, Dee. Glad you were able to cut in at exactly the right moment. That was perfect timing. So uh, now let me introduce our presenters. Uh, we have Megan Kells, who's an associate on Boyne Clark's business litigation team with a diverse litigation practice. She understands that clients need efficient, effective representation, and her focus is on offering timely, candid advice. And she works hard to help her clients get the best resolution possible. Alex Barnes practices in the area of areas of corporate and commercial law. Her practice extends to all matters relating to commercial transactions involving asset and share purchases, financing and real estate sales. Alex also works in, the, in general corporate matters, including registration of businesses and partnerships in Nova Scotia Incorporation of, with, uh, of Nova Scotia Limited and unlimited liability companies and assets with amalgamations and reorganizations. And finally, last but not least, we have Ian Brown, Ian is a partner and member of the business law team focusing on labor and employment law. Sorry, I just had to swallow there. It's a lot of reading. Uh, Ian advises, regularly advises clients on all matters related to the workplace from hiring processes through to termination, including managing employees, employment agreements, and restrictive covenants, human rights, employee absences, and related matters. Thank you very much, Megan, Alex, and Ian for joining us today and welcome to all of you. If you uh, would, do you have anything you'd like to say to kick us off before we uh, jump into questions and things? Nope. Okay. No, uh, I think we're good to go. Because <laughs> we have lots of questions already. So yeah. just a reminder to, uh, to everyone, uh, you'll see at the bottom of the screen, there's the Q&A box. You can click on the Q&A box. Let me just open that up so I can see the Q&A box when you, uh, when you type something. Uh, and there's the uh, the Zoom uh, the Zoom chat as well. So uh, as you ask questions, we'll try to close the questions so that you'll be able to see that uh, that the questions are gone. And I think all of our panelists can see the Q and A and the chat uh, as we go through. But I'll try and stick to the uh, to the questions. Um, so Megan, let's start with you since you're at the uh, the top of my screen. Uh, uh, so here's a question. My customers aren't paying their bills, aren't paying my bills. There we go. Aren't paying my bills. Um, what can I do 
to, uh, to help with that. Uh, thanks, Patrick. So uh, I think, as everybody here probably knows, most businesses have been affected by COVID in some manner. Uh, many are, we've heard, are choosing to wait the full repayment period uh, that invoices allow before settling them, uh, whereas previously they may have uh, settled them quite a bit sooner or right after receiving them. But we are, exp we are hearing that people uh, have invoices that aren't being paid at all. We would recommend that you first reach out to the company themselves, especially where you have long-standing relationships and in a place like Halifax and Dartmouth where that is the norm. Uh, companies may be able to work out an agreement like a payment plan or a payment deferral. Sometimes getting 50% of what you are owed is better than getting nothing. Uh, so we would recommend that as usually your first step. Uh, we would suggest that you make sure all negotiations and any eventual agreement is captured in writing. This is also a good point where if you want to amend a contract, it's probably a good idea to have a lawyer take a look at it so that you know exactly what you're signing uh, and also so that you can get an idea of any consequences that come from this amendment, uh, some of which may not be intended, uh, and you have an idea uh, to make sure that those consequences are something you consider before you amend it. If you don't have success in negotiating or if things go sour later, you may wish to sue for payment. Uh, depending on the circumstances, that's something that you can proceed in small claims court or sometimes Supreme Court. Um, each case is so different that you should probably consider scheduling a consult with a lawyer to discuss the specifics and uh, what your options could be. Okay, great. Okay. Um, but I, I, I'm going to start with, I think your very first point is you should reach out to the other organization often to try to have that conversation first. Um, um, especially during these times, I guess, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, when you're dealing with lawyers such as Ian and Alex, who are on the commercial side, uh, those tend to be um, contract negotiations and uh, going forward. But when you end up with me, uh, it, we're usually in some a bit muddier waters. So I, uh, I always recommend that people do try to negotiate something themselves. Um, and try to, to get to an agreement. Uh, if things aren't working out, uh, we are really experienced in negotiating to try to find a solution, or if you need a bit of a stronger hand, uh, we tend to do that as well. Oh, great, okay, thanks. Um, Alex, so uh, now our, uh, uh, we've had a conversation with somebody, uh, and uh, you've realized that now we're gonna put the shoe on the other foot, uh, and we wanna get out of the contract uh is there is there a way to get out of a contract at this point i guess the question is who drafted it at that point but <laughs> <laughs> no uh you know usually contracts are meant to be airtight and kind of consider all different situations and ramic ramifications but as i'm sure you've all kind of experienced in email which we're experiencing unprecedented times at this point so sorry oh, i can't help Sorry, that was my watch. Um, <laughs> uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, you, the first step is, I guess, you've really got to go back to your contract. If you didn't read it when you signed it, now's probably a good time to have a look at it, see what you're in for. Um, kind of circling back to your first question, Patrick, contracts are simply agreements between parties. So, you know, if, if one side or many sides, if it's a multi-party contract, aren't able to fulfill certain obligations or terms of the contract. If you can come to an agreement, it, you know, if it's a permanent agreement and you're completely, you know, new contract, that's great. Uh, if it's an interim agreement, then, you know, until things kind of start to, you know, come back to somewhat of a norm, then that's also something that you can do. But if, you know, if that's not going to fly and you, or looking at ways that you need to get out or delay performance of, of a contract, then there's a couple of legal principles that, that can come into play and it's really fact specific. So I'm gonna go through them. Okay. And it, it really depends on whether it's in your contract or, or what your, your circumstances are on whether they can apply. But the first one is con contractual law. So this will, this is called force majeure clause. 
And um, it really only applies if you've got this type of clause in your contract. So you'd want to have a look at your contract and see if, if this, if it's usually named a force majeure clause, but otherwise you can, you can review the clauses and see um, if what I'm talking about has uh, any kind of similarity to any clauses in your contract. Uh, it's intended to limit liability of one or more parties in the contract if unforeseen events, you know, outside of the control of the parties prevent um, the performance of the contract from occurring or it's resulting in a delay. Uh, so force majeure clauses are, can, can, can really vary. So it, it depends on who drafted it, what type of industry you're in. So even if you do have a force majeure clause, it's not necessarily a slam dunk. So again, it's probably time to go and see a lawyer and see if, see if you're, you're uh, going to be successful under that clause. Uh, and otherwise, there's two common law principles, which mean they're not really in contract. They're just kind of legal principles that have developed over time. Uh, and they're known as frustration and impossibility. Uh, they are somewhat similar, similar to each other. It really takes a keen eye to kind of distinguish them. Uh, but they basically are what they sound. Uh, it's either the contract is now impossible to, uh, you know, fulfill as a result of this, uh, as a result of this unforeseen event, which would be the COVID-19 pandemic in, in this circumstance, or, you know, if, if the contract has been frustrated so much so that uh, your obligations can no longer be fulfilled. So, so those are two little outs that you can rely on. They're, they have a very high threshold. So unfortunately, it is, they're very rare and it's difficult to um, be successful under those, but, you know, they're kind of a last chance uh effort i guess so just on force majeure so you know i kind of thought some of the contracts we may have in place with the uh, chamber of commerce when the pandemic first struck i thought well we'll be able to get out of all of these for sure using the force majeure clause which i'm sure would address a pandemic um i don't think it did uh, in, in the end <laughs> for some of our contracts but i, I guess it it does kind of depend on I mean, I suppose pandemic is not mentioned as part of the force majeure clause, usually, is it? Yes, yeah, no, exactly. So the force majeure really applies to, I mean, it, as I said, it really depends on what, how it was drafted, but it can apply to natural disaster, acts of God, you know, in the like, um, world war, you know, all types of events that may be unforeseen. So sometimes like health crisis, disease or pandemic aren't included. And, you know, you may not be able to rely on such a clause. So that's why, you know, even if you do have one, it's not necessarily, um, you know, a, a relief that you'll be able to use. Right. Well, you can be sure I'll be putting it in my contracts from now on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, probably a good idea. idea. <laughs> um, Ian, um, on to staff. So now I've, uh, I've uh, <laughs> my customers aren't paying my bills. I've tried to break contracts. But now it's time for me to... Uh, um, try to bring some of my staff back. What if I can't rehire all of my staff because my business has kind of gone a little bit the other way? Um, so I guess uh, two parts on that one is there's, there could be a situation where simply to that question specifically, you can't bring everyone back. And there may be a situation where um, it's not where you flip a switch and everyone comes back. You may want to trickle some people back over time as they meet your needs. So um, if you know for an employee that it's just a hard no and there's not going to be a position for them as a result of this situation, because I'm sure this situation is spawning reorganizations as, or reorganizing of the organization as uh, businesses kind of pivot and try to adapt to the situation. Um, then I think once you know that it's just not, this employee's been laid off and they're just not going to be recalled, um, I think there's an obligation on the employer to let that employee know. And of course, you should investigate carefully what your severance risks are. I think step one, of course, is to investigate what your business needs are of who you want back. But I think part of that equation is figuring out uh, how, how much risk is there. Because for example, if you have one employee who's 26 and has been with you for six, I'm talking non-union, has been with you for you know six months and they're great, yeah, maybe you want to keep them, but at the same time, if you have an employee that's in their 50s, it's been with you for 20 years, and they're, they're good, but they're not great, um, it's going to be a lot more expensive to deal with that 
older, longer tenured employee than, than the younger one. So uh, absolutely, it's possible to not bring back people who have been laid off. If you laid them off for whatever reason, you gave notice or you said because of COVID-19, you're not able to give notice and they've been waiting to get recalled, uh, the Labor Standards Code and again, non-union environments distinguishes between termination and discharge. So if it's been within a year, um, you, I don't recommend that businesses just hope that the employee doesn't notice that they haven't been called back. I think they've got to reach out to them because you're really kind of flipping that switch and going from a layoff to a discharge, which may trigger notice obligations depending on uh, whether or not you gave them notice before, depending on the, to Alex's point about frustration or COVID-19, your business needs, what your employment contract says, there's quite a lot in there. Uh, to just touch very briefly on the union side, you'd want to turn to your collective agreements and see what that says, how to that situation. But to circle back to the question, absolutely, you don't have to bring everyone back and, and business may not be there for those folks. But there's quite a lot to consider when you're making those decisions. But there's not really a rule, and maybe you're alluding to this, if you've got a, and you know, this sounds terrible to even say it, but you've got a 26-year-old employee and you've got an employee who's been with you for 20 years. I mean, there's a moral obligation, I suppose, <laughs> to bring back the 20-year the employee. But, but there's not, if you're a non-union environment, you don't have to bring back that employee first. Well, that's a great question because... Uh, legally speaking, in a regular old non-union employment environment, there's no kind of uh, seniority rights. But uh, I, I agree, there, there's probably a bit of a moral question in there. But also, there's a perception question. Because a lot of people think that they have, because they've given that amount of time, that they have this kind of right. So how you handle that is not only going to dictate uh, how the negotiations go with whatever that that particular employee, but I think it could impact morale at your organization. And I think it's important to think about morale when you're making those calls, because a lot of people have talked about this, how your business handles this situation is going to, it's going to resonate. So I think it's important to consider that as well. Yeah. Okay. No, great point. Um, Megan, I'm going to come back to you and, and say, I'm, I'm struggling to meet my financial obligations. Um, do I have options as a business um, at this point? So that's a great question. Um, the answer is there's no magic wand or solution. This is a really tough time for a lot of businesses. Um, and you may, uh, you may have to make some tough choices, but you do have options. Uh, so Alex discussed contracts specifically. If you uh, are, if your obligations include contracts, which could be verbal or written, hopefully they're written. It's a lot easier to deal with if they are. Um, you should review those. You should see if you can negotiate agreement. Same things we discussed before. You should make sure that that's in writing and consider what the consequences of that are. Um, but apart from con contractual obligations, you do have some other options. Uh, I know the Chamber of Commerce and uh, the GBBA has done a great job of keeping their members informed of um, government programs that are available. Those are something that people should absolutely take a look at. Um, you should consider reaching out to your bank or, your, or any other loan provider and discuss options for relief. Uh, they are having these conversations a lot, um, and it is something that uh, is definitely worth looking at. Uh, most people have probably heard of the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy. That's something that might be worth looking into and seeing if it applies. Um, that will cover 75% of an employee's wages, um, up to about $847 weekly, but you do have to meet some specifications uh, to apply for that. Um, also, all businesses, including self-employed individuals, and that's important because uh, some of these other programs won't um, apply for self-employed individuals, but all businesses, including those who are self-employed, are permitted to defer income tax um, amounts that become owing on or before March 18th. 
up until and before September 2020. Uh, and at the moment, no interest or penalties are going to accumulate on those amounts. So that's something that you definitely want to look into if you're struggling to meet payments at the moment. That might be a payment that you don't have to meet. Um, and it, with no interest and no penalties, it almost becomes an interest-free loan. You still are obliged to pay that at the end of it. Um, but it might help bridge that gap while we start opening up. Right. Uh, those are just... Uh, we could go on all day about it. I know the Chamber and GBBA are great resources. So if you're considering what, uh, what programs might apply to you, I would suggest definitely reaching out to you guys. Um, and if you want to review and analyze your unique circumstances, then coming and talking to a lawyer uh, is definitely an option. We uh, do this pretty frequently and are very happy to assist. That's great, okay, thanks. Um, uh, Alex, so um, Megan just talked a little bit about contracts uh, and you talked about contracts to begin with. Should we be looking at our current contracts? Um, is there something we should, what should we be looking for when we're looking at our current contracts? Uh, well, I, I think, you know, it, it's always, as I said, if you haven't, if you haven't looked, at your looked at your contract at all, or if you haven't looked at it in a while, I think it's a really good idea to have a look at it and, you know, see what you agreed to and, uh, what, you know, some relief could be or, or how you can handle, uh, you know, the impact of this, this pandemic. Um, uh, I think it's, it's really important because it, it kind of swings both ways in that if you're looking for relief uh, under your contract, uh, you, you probably, you know, when you signed it or if you've looked at it in the past, you aren't looking at under the light of a global pandemic and how, and the closures and everything that's gone on. So, uh, you know, I think if you're looking at it, looking for some relief like termination or delay of obligations uh, or, or any, anything like that, um, it, it's important to go back have a look for a force majeure clause, have a look for delay clauses. Sometimes delay clauses can pop up and you know how the parties have agreed to handle um, unforese unforeseen circumstances that result in delay. Um, but then on the flip side, I guess, if you're, you're looking in your contract to see how you can enforce certain provisions, uh, it, it's important to go and have a look at how you're, how you're able to do that legally and, and what's required to do so. Uh, a lot of the time you, you have to give notice and that's going to be a certain period of time before you actually act on, on the enforcement of that contract. So uh, I, think, I think it's really important to make sure you have your ducks in a row before you start, uh, you know, start down a path. Um, and if you get too far, there's, you, you sometimes shoot yourself in the foot. Okay, okay thanks. Um, uh, Ian, I see there's a question up here in the Q&A, so just a reminder for everybody to take a look at the Q&A or, or to post a question on the Q&A so we can address you specifically or the, or the chat function. So in a non-union environment, can an employer who was closed due to COVID decide not to bring back an employee who was laid off due to COVID and hire a new employee? Great question. So um, in that environment, uh, kind of central to that part is how long your non-union employee was with you. So if you have an employee in Nova Scotia that's been with you for more than 10 years, then they have what's called tenure of employment. And really the only way they can be let go is if there's just cause for termination, which is a pretty high bar, or if there's been really a bona fide elimination of that position, i.e. Your, your company is reorganized and that position simply doesn't exist anymore. So if they're not tenured, then the answer is yes. And circling back to my answer before, the only question is, is for the obligations to the employee you didn't bring back, you might have severance obligations and those kinds of things, but there's nothing preventing you from severing that employee and bringing on somebody else. The, where you get into a question, uh, an issue is, um, is if, you are going to say eliminate a job and you bring somebody new on to do that exact same job. That, that can be a problem because you didn't really eliminate the job. So a uh, simple answer is uh, yes, you can lay someone off and hire someone different if you like, but when you get into tenured employees, it does become quite a bit more complicated. I'm gonna sort of make this a two-part question. So I've had a lot of questions from people about CERB. Um, 
So uh, people may have been laid off. At some point, they went on the CERB benefit, the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit, which is up to $2,000 a month. Um, and then when they were called back to come back, they said, eh, you know, I'm kind of liking this $2,000 um, and it's close to what I was earning before. So I don't think I'll come back yet. Um, how do you deal with that? Is there a, you know, what should you do if you still want somebody or needs that person to come back and yet they're unwilling to come back uh, because they're getting the CERB benefit? Well, if it's specifically the way you describe where they just think, well, you know, I enjoy not working and the money's about the same, they have to come back. If they've been recalled to work, you can require them to return to work. I, you should put it in writing that you're recalling them to return to work. And if they don't return by X date, you're going to take the position that they've abandoned their job and you'll reissue a new ROE saying that they've quit. And if they don't come back, they've quit, they'll lose the CERB. Um, but what I think you're a little more likely to come across is if someone's afraid to come back or concerned, and maybe this will get into other questions, so I'll just kind of kind of allude to it, but if, if it's an occupational health and safety concern, then you've got to make sure that you've taken all the right steps to make it a safe environment for them to come back. Right. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so now my, I, that was sort of the good news part of the questions so far, uh, which is my business is now improving uh, and therefore I need to recall people. Um, but now, you know, and we're going to go, we're going to go back to Alex with perhaps a bad news question again, which is I'm unable to pay my rent. Uh, and rent is a big deal right now. A uh, big deal because um, many, many businesses are having trouble paying the rent because they were order closed or closed in order to ensure the safety of their employees or fellow Nova Scotians. Um, and yet there's been some programs, but there hasn't been wide availability of, of programs to help them with rent. Um, so what can I do if I can't pay my rent? Uh, thanks, Patrick. This is an interesting one. And you know, I'm not originally from um, Canada, but I'm from Australia. Uh, you can probably tell by the accent, but I am really impressed. You know, I guess there's obviously mixed reviews, but you know, I am impressed with the Canadian government coming out with these really um, up-to-date uh, policies and programs that are, that are assisting people. Uh, you know, I'm sure you've everyone on the call has heard of a couple here and there. I'm going to just touch base on two. Obviously, the first step would be to reach out to your landlord if you know they they have policies as well that are available to them. And, and, and when I get when I get into these two programs, it really is a dual approach. You need to have cooperation with yourself and your landlord um, in order to kind of maximize the benefit that you and your landlord are going to get from these policies. So, so I think that's important to have an open dialogue and uh, get, get on the same page with them to start off with. Uh, the first one, which has been in place for a couple of, uh, a month now, I think around, or no, probably two months is the rent deferral program. Uh, and and it, it's been put on by the government in, in an attempt to indemnify landlords from uh, any losses as a result of people not paying their rent. Um, and that was kind of an introductory one. You know, they, they obviously it was very thorough, but uh, I, I think the time to apply for that has now passed, but uh, I know many people have taken advantage of it. Uh, it's up to $5,000 per month for qualified businesses who are directly impacted by the Health Protection Act order. Um, and, and so from, from that, uh, an, a new program has just come out. And if I recall the acronym is the Canada Emergency Commercial Rent Assistance Program. Right. And I kind of get a kick out of this one um, because it's for small businesses. Uh, and so the definition, I guess, of small business for, for eligibility, eligibility for this program is you have to have less than $20 million in revenue a year and you can't be paying more than $50,000 gross rent a month. You have to have I think it's a 70% reduction in revenue from your comparable month the previous year, and you get a 75% assistance in rent. Um, so that is, that's a big one. Lots of people are probably eligible for it. There's a few other criteria that you would have to meet, so, so it's helpful to look into it. As a Boyne Club, we've been frantically trying to keep up with all these programs, so we can also help you out if you have any questions. Um, but the big one with the 
commercial emergency rental, com no, Canada Emergency Commercial Rent Assistance Program is that landlords pay for it. Uh, landlords apply for it. So that's where I was getting at when you kind of got to be in communication with your landlord. So um, landlords apply for it. The government will pitch in 50%. The landlord eats 25% of the rent. And then the tenant contributes 25% of the rent. So, and, and that's for three months. Uh, and uh, you can only do one of those programs. So if you're under the rent deferral support program, you should really discuss with your landlord, you know, do some analysis yourself, see which one you think is better for you. If you want to terminate the current rent deferral support program, you can, and then move on to this, this next one. Um, so it, it's kind of a, an analysis on which, which one you think is better for you and in discussions with your landlord, whether they're willing to make the application for you. Yeah, it's a it's a messy one. They, uh, we're calling it Sikra. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, you know, I, I suppose it's supposed to be Kikra, but that doesn't really make any sense with Canadian. Uh, but um, yeah, it's a it's a it's a tricky one. We've heard a lot uh, from a number of members um, that landlords aren't participating, uh, but we've also heard from a number of landlords who say they're unable to participate because. Um, their mortgage or the payments that they make are greater than 75%. So uh, they're actually underwater uh, by mm -hmm. participating in this. Um, I will tell you, and I probably shouldn't be speaking out of school, but I do have a call tomorrow morning with the provincial and federal government to discuss the harmonization mm -hmm. uh, of the two programs. So the deferral and the, uh, and the CICRA. Uh, so I think the federal government, it's probably fair to say the federal government wants the programs uh, to work and the provincial government wants it to be harmonized so that it can work. Mm -hmm. um, so let's hope that, you know, that, that works out to a, a good uh, outcome. Um, luckily, we're recording the call, so now this will be there for posterity uh, to, mm -hmm. to tell people that I, I'm participating in this call. I probably yeah. shouldn't have said that. I know. But well, I'm hoping. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you know what happens, Alex. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> and so actually, um, for us, like what I've seen a lot is people who did kind of, it's difficult because it's, um, it's very fluid, but people who did enroll in the deferral support program see this program coming down the, down the pipe and they, you know, they're more interested in that. The landlord's on board. They liked, you know, if they're going to give up 25%, then that's okay. So we're doing a lot of, you know, termination agreements of the deferral support program, uh, you know, and they're always contingent on the... CICRA uh, application being approved. Oh, really? Oh, that's very interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that is very interesting. I will have to pass that on yeah. in, my, uh, in my call tomorrow. Uh, so Megan, uh, back to you. So, um, you know, as we, as we start to come out of this, what, what, what are some of the most important things legally? What are some of the most important things um, I can do to protect my business on a go forward basis as, we, uh, as we're in a pandemic and hopefully come out of the pandemic? Uh, well, that's a really great question. Um, I'm referencing magic wands a bit too often, I think, but there's still no magic wand for this one. Um, it is, it's a really tough question because the answer is it depends. Uh, I don't think anybody in 2019 or at least early 2019 would have thought we would be in a pandemic at this point. And so there's nothing that you can do that's going to be bulletproof to protect your business. Uh, what we would recommend is like we discussed earlier reviewing your contracts uh, to see what they allow for and what your obligations are um, but more than that we would recommend continuing or beginning a really open dialogue with your uh, suppliers with your um, partners and with your customers uh, so that you have the ability to be flexible with these changing and uh, unprecedented times. It's, we don't know what the next pandemic is going to be, if it would be a pandemic, perhaps. Uh, world wars have been referenced in uh, contracts, but we've yet to see another one of those, thankfully. Um, so you, you really can't predict what the next big uh, change is going to be, but you can control being able to, to, you can control being as fluid as possible in your business so that you can react to these changes. The other thing that we would recommend that I think most people on this call would do is keep up to date on the news. Uh, make sure that you are 
complying with government directives um, and try to be forward thinking when uh, big changes are happening. Uh, it's certainly easier to do, uh, to say what you should have done in hindsight. Um, I think we'd all have pandemic insurance in hindsight, but uh, it, it, if you are able to be flexible and keep on top of uh, as much as possible what's coming down the pipe, that will put you in a better position going forward. Great. Okay. No, that's great. Thanks. Um, Back to you, uh, back to you, Ian. Uh, so a question uh, from uh, an attendee, if daycare is open and employees are recalled, uh, what if the employee says they don't want to send their child to daycare um, if they're concerned, I suppose, about health, and therefore they no longer have daycare, so they cannot come back to work in the office environment? I think I'm going to assume well, I guess that's just recalled. I, I won't make any assumptions. So if they're recalled, so let's say they've been off, but they're uncomfortable sending their child to daycare um, and they therefore say, I can't come back. So a couple of layers in this one, um, saying they don't want to send them, in my opinion, is not good enough. Um, if there's no daycare to send your kids to, that's one thing. If there is no safe daycare to send your kids, that's another. And depending on whose determination of safe is it. And I mean, I'm a parent, I understand this completely, but um, there has to be kind of an objective analysis of, of that safety and not just someone's subjective opinion of whether or not they wanna send their kids there. Um, in human rights, there's two uh, protected grounds, I think that are kind of triggered in this circumstance. One is accommodation for family status. You can't discriminate against an employee on the basis of family status. And pandemic aside, if someone was having childcare issues, you can't hold that against them. You've got to work with them up to undue hardship, they say, uh, to, to try and find a solution if you can. What undue hardship is going to, is completely would change depending on the size, nature of your business, and so on. The other layer here is, uh, and I've said this in a few of, of these things, is there's a fear of irrational fear of contracting a disease, which is protected under uh, our human rights uh, legislation, which I never thought I would come across in practice, but here, here we are. Th this would be a good example for that, is even if all the boxes are checked and someone's just really afraid, they may actually be protected under human rights and you have to work with them. So the, some of the questions I would ask is, is there a middle ground? Is there a, is, is there a possibility that you could have them work remotely? Um, is, is there some sort of, uh, assistance that you can provide to, 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 to make it work on a very simple analysis of that question. I, I think there has to be some dialogue with the employee, you know, have you tried to find other solutions? Why is that daycare not safe? Those kinds of things. Um, but these are all relevant questions that are going to come up as this unfolds. Um, and I think it's still going to be kind of, there's a, there should always be a dialogue and there has to be sort of this objective based on the common knowledge we have of what the requirements are of social distancing and those kinds of things, an objective analysis of why someone is saying that it's safe or not. So to kind of pick up on that. Um, what if I have an employee and I just checked to make sure the employee that asked me that this morning was not on the call and they're not. Uh, so, uh, so I'm going to say, uh, what if an employee says, I work better remotely, um, I get more done, uh, and I'm a more effective employee, um, I don't want to come back to work. Well, I guess in that circumstance, yeah, I mean, they're still working. If, if, if objectively they are working better, and they are getting more done, and they're more productive, then I'd ask the employer, what's, is there a problem with this, right? And I suspect that from sort of an HR perspective, you're going to have you're going to have some employees that just do great in this environment and you're going to have other ones that, that just don't. Um, and I think a lot of businesses are going to see where they haven't really thought about it before that there is some more flexibility. And I would encourage you if you're being dogmatic, I mean, I'm, I, I'm kind of old school in this regard. I like to go to work to work. Um, the, the, you might, if you might want to reassess this and see, okay, well, maybe there's an opportunity here. Maybe you can accommodate that. And maybe there's an opportunity to save on office space. I don't know. There might be, if you might be able to reallocate some of your resources. Uh, it's really a policy question of whether or not you're comfortable as an employer having some employees work remotely as long as they're getting the work done. And in my opinion, if they're getting the work done, then I guess what's the problem? Okay. Okay. No, that's a reasonable, reasonable answer. Um, 
Megan, back to you. So now we're, uh, we're you know, we're hopefully heading out of the pandemic uh, and starting to think about reopening. Um, so if I reopen my store and a client or customer gets ill from entering my business or tells me they got ill from entering my business, am I at fault uh, for, uh, for them getting ill if they come to my business? Uh, well, that's a really good question. And it's something that I think uh, we're going to be addressing. Uh, the answer to that is it depends. Unfortunately, it depends on the circumstances. Um, however, I think the first point that's uh, important to address is something like COVID-19, where the spread is uh, through the community, um, less so now, yay, but uh, it is community spread. It's very easily transmissible. Um, it is going to be very difficult for a person to prove that they got COVID from your business. That's going to be a hurdle that uh, is tough for them to get over in litigation. Um, but the fact that that will be a difficult case doesn't necessarily protect your business from uh, anybody suing you for that uh, or eventually uh, that suit being successful, possibly. Um, the things that you can do to prevent it uh, are you can make sure you're up to date with any government regulations or public health uh, directives that are out there. So we all know the six meter uh, to six feet, two meter rule at the moment. Um, so trying to keep that social distancing as part of your policy um, and really, I guess, getting in front of it, uh, listening to your consumers, your customers and your employees if they have any concerns and addressing those uh, if and when appropriate, as well as ensuring you're in line with any uh, directives that you need to be in line with. Um, and then really importantly, documenting everything that you're doing. So if you're purchasing PPE or requiring people to wear masks, uh, document that. If you're limiting the number of people who are in your business at any one time, document that as well. Um, that will help protect you uh, and enable you to show that you did everything possible to mitigate the risk of transmitting uh, COVID-19 within your business um, or anything else within your business. So that documentation hopefully uh, will help. But I think we circling back to listening to people, if people are telling you that they're concerned, really uh, analyze that and see if you can do something to to get in front of that. Okay, no, that's great, thank you. Um, Alex, I think we've got a question here from, for you and it's, I'm selling my business during this period. The buyer wants to renovate the store before he form, formally takes over. Should I agree to this deal? The buyer's reason is the store is closed anyway um, and I'm paying the rent but not doing the business. So should I sell the business um, and let them renovate before they formally take over? Well, I guess my first question is who's paying for the renovations? Um, but, you know, if, when you're in a transactional kind of nature like this, it's all, you know, it's all up to negotiation and what the parties can agree to. So if, if this purchaser is, if it's a condition on closing, oh, the, the purchaser, right. I see yeah. that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, I mean, if that's a condition on closing that, uh, that the, the place is renovated, you know, to the satisfaction of the purchaser, then I, I, maybe now is a great time to do that considering the business is closed. You'd have to look at any implications. Like, you know, if, if you're gonna keep the ownership of the business while it's being renovated, you may have to look at uh, any loan obligations you have or notice you have to give people. Um, but, uh, you know, it, and another thing I'm thinking of now is if you've signed an acquisition agreement, uh, was it in the acquisition agreement? If it's not and you haven't signed one, is it going to be in it? You know, what are the parameters of the renovation? How much access and control does the purchaser have when conducting the renovation? So I think, um, I think you know, the, the crux of it is pretty 
uh, okay from the sounds of things. Um, but I do think you need to flesh out a lot of the details to make sure that you're protected, you know, in case things goes longer and they're in renovating and you, you're still in control and things are opening up and you're losing money. So there's lots of parameters that you've got to keep nice and tight there if you do agree to that. Right. Okay. Okay. So the more paper, the better probably in this case, right? So yes. down on paper. I yeah. think in, yeah, I think in this case, the more you can kind of um, mold the agreement and kind of make sure nothing unforeseen or out of the blue comes in. Um, okay. And you've, you've dealt with all of that within the agreement, that would be your best case scenario. Okay, great. Okay. Ian, um, again, we're sort of headed back to work now. Uh, what changes do I need to implement in the workplace before we return to work, if any? Um, so, uh, great question. And uh, this is kind of to jump on where, where Megan left off. Um, the key here is occupational health and safety and taking all those internal steps because certainly uh, there are outward concerns about the general public and, and possibility of liability to uh, other folks that come into your business, but there's a huge risk uh, to the business from within not just in terms of liability for occupational health and safety, but making sure you have the right steps in place. Because if you were going to have an outbreak within your business and you know you have 10 people working and six of them become have to be quarantined as a result of contracting COVID, that could be detrimental on your business. So um, I think you need to get a very, make sure that you have all your needs in place, sort of as Megan had mentioned about social distancing, PPE, you may want to look at uh, personal protective equipment, you may want to look at scheduling uh, to accommodate how many people in a certain space, depending on the size of your organization, you may want to look at how many people can be in certain rooms at a certain time. There's, there's quite a lot to look into there to figure out what your plan is going to be. Then I think you need to put that to paper and communicate it to your staff, either generally what the approach will be, and then with appropriate signage in specific places, strategically hand, place hand sanitizer, those kinds of things, to make sure that everyone is safe and that you've done the due diligence to protect yourself, not just from liability, but to protect your employees so they don't get sick, because that can have negative ramifications across the board. So. Um, get that all into place and communicate to that with your employees. And in my view, if you're thinking, for example, of bringing folks back or, or getting back into the office in a physical presence, say, in July, well, now's the time to communicate with the employees about their concerns, because maybe you outline your plan, but you want some opportunity for them to be asked, able to ask questions. Uh, because if you, they may, first, they may raise things you didn't think of. But secondly, if you can kind of allay those concerns, then you're going to have less issues when you're trying to get back into the workplace. So, so it sounds to me, and based on your answer and, and Megan's answer, it sounds to me like the responsibility for kind of the safety of employees and safety of customers is the employer's responsibility. Is that, is that a fair comment? Yeah, well, my view, it kind of comes to a certain, for, for a big part, it comes within. And in occupational health and safety, your, your first defense is due diligence. I mean, you can't just do nothing and hope that everything works out. You've got to take those preventative steps. You're not going to be able to foresee every possible risk, but you need to take these steps and, and that is certainly going to help you, I think, in any either scenario if you uh, are threatened or if there's a complaint about your business. Okay, great. Okay. Um, Alex, so um, in that uh, ensuring that we have everything in place, insurance policies, um, should I be reviewing insurance policies and, and what should I be looking for in insurance policies? Uh, so when, you know, hopefully everyone has insurance, um, it, you know, I, I think this is a really good time. It's a good trigger as a result of this kind of global um, crisis that, you know, you go, you go back to your roots, you go to your contracts, you look at your insurance policies. Uh, I think it's useful to know what you're insured against. Uh, you know, insurance agencies aren't going to call you and say, listen, you have pandemic insurance. We want to fill your boots with cash. Um, so that's 
you know, I'm sure a lot of people have already done that, but you know, sometimes it kind of washes over your head. So I think it's important to go over, have a look, you know, lots of people had in pandemic insurance, not lots, but some people had pandemic insurance and they didn't really know. And, you know, it's taking a long time for the insurers to pay it out, but they're, they've got an application in the process, which is useful. Um, so that would be great. But, you know, if not, it, it's, it's useful to see what you're insured against, see what you're not insured against. Uh, look at maybe adding on some products. If, if, you, if you'd like, you've got to really look at like the cost benefit analysis. Pandemic insurance is one thing it has been around for a long time. Um, not sure how useful it's been in the past, um, but it's been very useful now. Uh, business interruption insurance, maybe another one, if you don't want to get a real specific, you know, pandemic insurance um, policy business interruption could be useful. You know, if you're a sole practitioner and something happens to you, business interruption may be useful. Um, but it kind of, it's a bit more broad than the pandemic policy. Uh, and, and so I, I do think it is important to kind of look at yourself from an insurance perspective and, and just make sure you're satisfied with um, the protections you have in place because you're paying for it one way or another. So, you know, it's good to kind of know where you're at with that. And you, we, you know, as lawyers review these in policies where we review contracts. So we're pretty familiar regularly and very much so now with respect to the current climate on, on what's useful, what's not, and how, how you can seek some relief from that. Um, yeah, we, we bought virus insurance in uh, January uh, oh, wow. for the Chamber of Commerce. Unfortunately, it was cyber security, uh, and that was the virus uh, that we, uh, the virus insurance we bought. So in the end, we were unable to collect anything uh, for, um, for, uh, for this. Um, <laughs> Ian, Ian, back to you. Uh, uh, are there any organizational policies we should be thinking about as we're coming back again uh, and as we're beginning to reopen? Yes, uh, <laughs> there, there, there's, there's, there's a few uh, that have been coming up uh, quite a lot in conversation. Of course, first and foremost is occupational health and safety, but there are other things to kind of take, take a look at and they, they draw upon a lot of things we've talked about. Uh, vacation usage, time and attendance, health and safety, uh, sick days, flexible arrangements for work uh, and performance management. Th those are all Kind of things in the HR side that I think need to be visited. And so vacation, just to flag that very briefly, you know, if you're thinking about opening up in September, uh, do you want all of your employees to take a vacation all in September? Because maybe people have been holding off waiting because they, while working remotely, they don't want to take it because they can't really go anywhere. So there, there should be some uh, discussion about this, but also some employer policies to kind of lay out when it's okay to take vacation, when it's not, and maybe even either change your policy with notice to the employees. If it's a unionized environment, then it's gonna, it's gonna be more difficult to do this and it's gonna have to be communication with the union. Non-union, it would be with sufficient notice or even put in a temporary policy for these extraordinary circumstances to kind of arrange how your expectations of when people can go on vacation when they can't. And also maybe encourage folks to take time off before then, uh, just even if nothing else for mental health reasons to get a bit of a break in this kind of stressful environment we find ourselves in. But I also encourage flexibility about attendance, things like that, that kind of touches on the childcare issues we talked about earlier. Uh, working remotely, you may want to accommodate some employees' needs. That actually may help you in being flexible about controlling your numbers of the workplace at one time. Um, and, and things like that. Maybe you maybe you have to revisit or at least analyze any kind of performance bonuses or commission structures you have in place in light of economic concerns that we have at the time. Uh, I, I would recommend that you give a kind of close look at all these policies and see what, if nothing else, should be tweaked temporarily while we weather the storm. Right. Well, and that that's kind of what we've done at the chamber. We've we've asked our employees, at least at this point, we've asked them to take 50% of their vacation in the summertime, uh, yeah. which probably isn't going to be a problem anyway. Uh, yeah. Because people would like to take their vacation. But I think when we asked them a month ago, um, it looked like we were going to be locked down forever and it wasn't quite as appealing. Uh, but I think folks are generally uh, generally going along. I'm gonna I, I, I just want to throw in there, I think that's a great approach. I, I really think it's where you can, it's really important to make it a dialogue instead of just dictating to your employees. I think it's, it, it's the better way to go. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
Um, uh, maybe this is uh, maybe this is Alex or Megan. I'll let you guys decide. If a sole owner uh, claims personal bankruptcy, can he terminate the lease immediately? Megan, how do you feel about that? Uh, I mean, my answer is I don't know. Um, I if I knew every single uh, law, I would be thrilled. Um, <laughs> Ian has more experience, and he may have come across this, um, but. If none of the three of us uh, have the answer, I would be happy to do the research and uh, and get an answer to you after this webinar. Yeah, I, I'll just chime in and I because I uh, in another life I did quite a bit of foreclosures and collections. Um, <laughs> I, my two cents is is that this is really if if someone's considering personal bankruptcy in the circumstance they need to talk to their trustee because all of their assets, all of their money, all of their obligations, it all vests in the trustee, and then it'll kind of continue on from there. So that really is not to avoid the question, but that's really kind of a technical question for the trustee. I don't think it's, my guess is it's not an automatic, you're out of the lease problem. It's, it's, it's gonna be uh, something that's gonna be after we worked out with your trustee. Okay, um, and then a final question, although maybe it's more of an accounting question than a law question, but can employees claim home expenses if they're working from home during COVID-19? Uh, I'll chime in then, I guess. Uh, yeah, no, I, you know what? I, I was speaking with a few accountants and I'm kind of keeping my electricity bills and my mortgage principal uh, interest payments and, and and that type of thing. I have a little home office set up. I've measured it out, how many square feet it is. So I certainly plan on doing that. Um, so yes, keep 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 receipts, keep oh, your great. bills, keep that type of thing in, in, in close uh, regard. Great. Okay. Well, I think we're running out of time, so I'm going to wrap it up there. Um, thank you very much to Megan, uh, Alex, and Ian for answering our questions and providing some insight on legal, um, legal obligations in the time of COVID-19. Thank you very much to all of our attendees uh, for joining us today. We are hosting more and more webinars every week uh, with experts in mindfulness, content strategy, change management, and I think even Fit Friday uh, this Friday. Uh, so a uh, little yoga, uh, maybe it's Pilates this week. Uh, so head to halifaxchamber.ca events for a full lineup. This webinar was recorded and will be available to all attendees shortly. Uh, and uh, we're looking for feedback on our webinars. So to help us shape future content, look for a survey, uh, the short survey that uh, in our follow-up email and tell us what you would like to see as webinar topics. And thank you very much, Megan, Ian, and Alex for joining us today. Really appreciate you. Boyne Clark, and of course, the Greater Burnside Business Association, MD, uh, for helping put this together. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, everybody.